So what we're going to be talking about today are basic electrical quantities. So we're going to start by talking about the relationship between charge and current. So the most basic concept with regards to understanding the behavior of an electrical circuit is that of electrical charge. Uh, electrical charge is a quantized property. And so what that means is that there are a discrete number of units of charge in any particular medium uh, determined by the number of protons and electrons that medium contains. Each of those quantized charges has a charge given by Q which is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, where the coulomb is the SI unit of charge. A proton has a charge of positive Q and an electron has a charge of negative Q. Um, when multiple charges are present in a system, uh, typically speaking, I will represent charge by a letter of positive, or excuse me, not positive, uh, uppercase Q. So I'll use uppercase Q to represent time invariant charges. and lowercase q to represent time varying charges. I'll try to use this um, gosh, I can't even think of the right word now. I'll try to represent all time invariant quantities with uppercase letters and all time varying quantities with lowercase letters so that we can distinguish between the two quantities easily. So what charge does in a circuit um, is two different things, okay? We can either have charges that move, which generate electrical currents, or we can have charges that separate which generate electrical voltage. So let's talk about currents first, right? So we have a basic understanding of what a charge is. Um, electrical current is defined as the time rate of change The time rate of flow, I guess would be a better word, of electrical charge passing through a conductor or circuit element. So if we had a section of wire, like so, I'm going to define a surface here on the interior of the wire. And the number 
of electrons pass through that surface in a given amount of time tells us how much current is flowing. What is interesting is that the current that we would observe flowing through this section of wire is actually in the opposite direction as to what we would expect. So when electrons move from left to right, we observe a current that flows from right to left. Uh, now this definitely is a little bit confusing, um, but it's a question of historical context. Uh, so what I mean by that is that when Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity way back in the 1750s, he arbitrarily assigned positive polarity to an excess of what he called an electric fluid and negative polarity to a deficiency of this electrical fluid. And this convention continued with the discovery of electric batteries, where it was assumed that current flowed from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. Electrons as a state of matter or whatever, um, were not actually discovered until the late 1800s. So effectively people had been dealing with the concept of electricity and current for about 150 years before anyone knew that electrons existed and so it was really too late to change the convention. Okay. So mathematically, the phenomenon that we observe of currents flowing when there is a rate of flow of electrical charge is given by the relationship I of T, current as a function of time, is dQ by dT or the change in current as a function of time. From this definition, we can see that the units of current, which are the ampere, is given as one ampere is equal to one coulomb of charge passing a particular point in an element in one second of time. Now, this mathematical expression tells us how to determine the magnitude of a current. There's a very fundamental extra piece of information that we need to know about a current, and that is its direction. So currents are required to have both a magnitude and a direction that tells us how the current is flowing through a circuit. Without these two pieces of information, the current is not fully defined. There will be times when we will have to assume the direction of current flow, okay? So for example, Let's say that I have a generic circuit element. Let's call it element A. And I told you that element A was carrying five amps of current. Well, if I don't tell you the direction as well, we don't have a well-defined system here, okay? So the direction of current is indicated using an arrow. So in this case, the arrow is pointed down, meaning that five coulombs of charge is passing through element A every one second, yielding a current of five amps direction down. We could just as easily call this a current of negative five amps 
with a reference direction up, okay? So to change the sign on a negative current requires us to change the direction of that current. If we were to ever assume a particular direction and find that the current that we calculate happens to be negative, all that means is that we've assumed the wrong direction, okay? There's nothing remotely wrong with that as we'll learn tools to have the sign and directions kind of work themselves out. So currents are represented in circuits, like I've shown here, with their magnitudes and, uh, which is what I'm calling this part right here, the five amps, and their direction with the arrows. So just to reiterate, we need both of those pieces of information to have a well-defined current. If we look at our mathematical expression, here, we can rewrite this slightly in order to determine charge from a known current quantity, okay? So if I were to mathematically manipulate that expression, what I could find is that charge Q as a function of M is equal to the integral from some time T naught, where the amount of charge passing through the element is known to some later point in time T of the current I of T prime dt prime plus Q at T naught box around this guy, because that's a useful equation I expect you to know, and a box around this guy as well. One question that I get asked relatively frequently is what the heck these prime things mean here, okay? Uh, so I'm not trying to say that we're taking the derivative with respect to time. I'm using T prime as a dummy variable representing time uh, because the variable T is in the limits of my integration. So I'm just trying to be mathematically correct about this. So let's say that I had somehow measured the current flowing through a particular circuit element as a function of time. Where in this case, time is measured in seconds, current is measured in amperes. And I observed a waveform that looks something like this. Say that my maximum amount of current is 10 amps. And this transition from a linearly increasing current to a DC current occurs at two seconds. And this transition from a DC or constant current to a linearly decreasing current occurs at six seconds. And I want to know the total amount of charge that has passed through this element at time t is equal to four seconds. So I want to know q of four seconds is equal to blank. And I know that q of zero seconds is equal to zero. How would I determine this? Well, there are really two different ways that we can approach this problem. Um, and they're both utilizing this equation right here. 
our first way is to handle this purely mathematically. Okay. So I could define I of T to be a piecewise function. So this looks like five amps per second times time over the interval from zero is less than T is less than two seconds. That looks like simply 10 amperes from two seconds is less than T is less than six seconds. And if I make this, let's call that nine seconds, um, it looks like negative 10 over nine, excuse me, over three, amps per second times T minus six seconds over the interval six seconds is less than T, less than nine seconds. So I could throw this piecewise representation of my current into my equation and do the math and I would get a numerical result. That's actually probably the hardest way to do something like this, right? The integral that I have and the waveform that I've chosen make solving a problem like this fairly straightforward in as much as I can subdivide my waveform into two sections. So I would have this triangular bit here and this rectangular bit right here. I could represent this with some area A1, this with some area A2, and the sum of those areas would be the exact same thing as if I had done this with a purely mathematical representation. Because as we all know, integration is simply the area under the curve, right? So in this case, A1, the area of my triangle is one half the base, which is two seconds, times the height, which is 10 amps. So that's going to be one half times two, which is one. One times 10 is 10. So this is 10 seconds times Coulomb per second gives me just 10 Coulombs. A2 is my base, four seconds minus two seconds times my height, 10 amps, which looks like 20 coulombs. And from this, Q of four seconds is simply A1 plus A2 plus Q at zero which comes out to be 30 coulombs. Does anybody have any questions regarding this example? All right, let's now move along to voltage. So the movement of electric charge through a circuit results in a transfer of electrical energy. Voltage is defined to be the amount of energy transferred unit charge needed to move charge 
between two points in a circle. Or mathematically, voltage is integral from some location, I'm going to call it x sub a, to some secondary location, x sub b. And it's the integral of an electric field vector E dotted into a differential line element L. Okay. Now, I understand that the overwhelming majority of you guys don't have a whole heck of a lot of experience dealing with electric field vectors. And that's perfectly okay, all right? Um, what I'm going to do is introduce what I'm gonna call an electrostatic force, uh, which is given by F because it's a force, and it has the subscript of E because it's electrostatic force, okay? And the expression for electrostatic force is simply Q times E. Okay. Where this is uh, the force that tells us how electrons repel each other and how protons repel each other, stuff like that, okay? Well, we can rewrite our voltage mathematical equation here as one over Q times the integral from X sub A to X sub B of our electrostatic force dotted into our different line element, DL. Well, this bit right here, the integral of force dotted into a different line, a differential line element is simply our equation for work from classical physics, okay? So a voltage is simply the work done per unit charge to move charge around. That's it, okay? Another way to think about it is voltage can be given or expressed as the difference in electrical potential between two points in a circuit, okay? So I'm gonna give you a second definition here. And this comes about purely because our mathematical definition is related to a line integral, okay? Um, our first definition about voltage being the amount of energy transferred per unit, per unit charge is more technically correct because it describes more so what voltage does. Uh, but our second definition about voltage being the difference in electric potential between two points in a circuit is actually a lot more useful for us um, when we have a limited understanding of the behavior of electromagnetic fields, okay? So the second definition is the one that we are really going to be utilizing a lot in this class. Now, the unit of voltage is the volt where one volt is equal to one joule per one coulomb of charge. 
much like what we saw with currents a few minutes ago, a voltage isn't fully defined without some other quantity. So for instance, if I said that I had a generic circuit element, again, let's go with circuit element A, and there was a three volt drop over this circuit element, this doesn't mean anything unless we also indicate the polarities involved. So typically speaking, we'll always have a positive polarity terminal and a negative polarity terminal, where the positive polarity terminal is indicated with a positive sign and the negative polarity terminal is indicated with a minus sign. All this means is that the positive polarity terminal is at a higher electrical potential than the negative polarity terminal. So we are all likely at least vaguely familiar with this. Uh, what I mean by that is if I draw, probably poorly, but I'll do my best here, what's supposed to represent a double A battery. Okay. This short terminal here is the positive polarity terminal and the wider terminal at the back is the negative polarity terminal. If this is a double A battery, there is a 1.5 volt potential difference or a voltage of 1.5 volts between the two terminals of this battery. If I had a generic circuit element, let's call this guy element B, and I had a voltage drop or potential difference of negative eight volts across my element. If I wanted to get rid of that sign, what I would do is change the polarity. So negative eight volts with positive polarity on top is the same as positive eight volts with negative polarity on top. So much like I can get rid of a negative sign on a current by changing the direction, I can get rid of the negative sign on a voltage by changing the polarity. And I've indicated here on our two generic circuit elements how we typically represent voltages in a circuit. Okay. Um, there are a couple of other ways that voltages can be represented. Okay. So this style using a positive polarity terminal and a negative polarity terminal is the conventional American style. Another way to do it let's say that we have element C would be to label our terminals. So let's call this terminal on top, terminal one, and this terminal on bottom, terminal two. So we could say that voltage V one, two is let's say five volts where the first subscript corresponds to the positive polarity terminal and the second subscript corresponds to the negative polarity terminal. So we could also say in this particular case, V21 is equal to negative five. And this is what's known as a double subscript notation. Um, we don't use it a lot in this class, but it will come up. So I just wanted to introduce it now. Another way that voltages can be represented in circuits, and this is how it's typically done in Europe, is something like this, where let's say that we have four volts and they'll draw an arrow from the negative polarity terminal to the positive polarity terminal. So this would be something like this with negative four volts. This is the European style, as I mentioned before. 
And I don't particularly care for this representation purely because I did all of my electrical engineering education here in the United States. And so I typically associate arrows with currents. So this is the representation that I will be using roughly 90 plus percent of the time. I'll use this guy uh, a few times in this class and I will pretty much never mention the third representation again. I just wanted to make you aware of it uh, because I know that some people like to supplement my lectures by watching videos on YouTube and things like that. And uh, if you see somebody using this uh, convention, it might be useful to understand exactly what's going on. So effectively for this uh, last convention here, the European convention, uh, the head of the arrow corresponds to the positive polarity terminal and the tail of the arrow corresponds to the negative polarity term. All right, so now that we've talked about the concept of current and how we represent it in circuits and the concept of voltage and how we represent it in circuits, I would like to introduce to you current and voltage sources that you will see throughout the duration of this class. Okay. So the first current source that you will likely see is something that looks like this. This is the symbol that I will be using for a DC current source, where the magnitude of the current that's being supplied by this source is given by the quantity IS, and the direction of the current that's being provided by this source is indicated by the direction of the arrow. Okay, so it contains a well-defined current. The second representation that you'll see much later on is effectively the exact same symbol, except that we put a little squiggle in the middle. And this is for an AC current source. So I'll represent the magnitude IS in lowercase letters because it is a time varying quantity. And I will also indicate that it varies with time by expressing it as a function of time. We'll see this uh, quite a lot when we get into the third section of the class. These two are examples of what are called independent sources. What an independent source does is it supplies a fixed amount of, in these cases, current, regardless of what is connected to the source, okay? So for our left-hand representation here, the DC current source, if IS happened to be, let's say two amps, that means that this current source would provide two amps of current in the up direction to any resistors, capacitors, inductors, et cetera, that are connected to it, regardless of whether they are physically there or not, okay? This is an idealized version. Um, obviously, we couldn't force current to flow through nothing, or I guess technically we can, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but what I'm trying to, to drive home here is that the amount of current that's being supplied by this source is fixed, okay? Now, I wanna contrast that with these next two current sources. So 
So this is going to be what I'll call a current controlled current source. The diamond shape is what lets us know that it is a dependent source. We'll talk about that in a moment once we bring the other one into the fold. The direction of this current is indicated by the arrow. The magnitude of this current is usually given by some scaling parameter K times some reference current, which in this case, I'm just gonna call IX, where K has units of, excuse me, amps per amp or unitless. So what this current controlled current source does is it supplies a fixed amount of current that depends on a current flowing elsewhere in the circuit. Our last possible current source will have the exact same symbol, but it will be a voltage controlled current source. And its magnitude will be described by some parameter R. Excuse me, I take that back. Some parameter G times some reference current IX. No, I'm sorry, some reference voltage VX. Sorry, I apologize uh, for that mistake. Where G has implied units of amps per volt. So for a voltage controlled current source, the amount of current that is being supplied by the source depends on some voltage elsewhere in the circuit. Um, I find that students typically don't enjoy uh, problems that include these dependent sources. Um, a, because they're a little tricky uh, in as much as the symbols are literally identical. So you have to pay attention to what the controlling variable is in order to determine what type of source it is. And B, because they have a hard time relating it to anything practical. Um, these controlled or dependent sources um, are typically used in advanced electrical engineering classes to more easily modify or, or quantify or develop models for um, the behavior of difficult circuit elements like uh, the small signal behavior of transistors uh, and things like that, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk about voltage sources in a moment and students typically can figure out what's going on there pretty easily because you can go buy a voltage source at the grocery store, that's what batteries are, but you can't go buy current sources um, at your, your standard uh, store, even uh, while well, Radio Shacks don't really exist anymore, but even specialized places um, don't really offer current sources so much. And then I add on top of that, that we have dependent sources where the current that's being supplied uh, depend on some quantity elsewhere in the circuit. And uh, I, I get that it's cumbersome and I get that it can be confusing, but they're actually very, very important um, components to understand how to analyze. Okay. 
Um, so I, I fully expect um, lots of questions whenever we actually start utilizing these in circuits. I, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I know that they're annoying, but they are a necessary evil for this class. All right, so these are our four different types of current sources. Now let's talk about voltage sources. So the first voltage source that I'm going to draw is one that I believe you should be familiar with. And this is the schematic representation of a battery. So this will be some voltage Vs. The long horizontal bar represents the positive polarity terminal of the battery. And the shorter horizontal bar represents the negative polarity terminal of the battery. Then we have this guy. Which is our simple DC voltage source. And effectively, um, it is the exact same thing as a battery. In fact, a battery is an example of a generic DC voltage source. I typically prefer to represent all DC voltage sources, regardless of whether or not it's a battery, using this particular symbol. Uh, and the reason why I prefer this symbol, even for batteries, is because the positive polarity terminal and the negative polarity terminal of the voltage source are well-defined. Um, we are going to be talking about capacitors here in a couple of weeks whose schematic symbol looks like a pair of parallel plates. And I have found that sometimes um, people get batteries and capacitors confused. So I try not to use that symbol on the left. We also have AC voltage sources. Where now our voltage Vs is a time varying quantity. And these three representations are our independent voltage sources. And over here on the right, we will introduce our two dependent voltage sources. So this guy is going to be a voltage controlled voltage source. Where the magnitude is given as K times Vx, where K as units of volts per, per volt, or you can consider it a unitless quantity. And we will also see this guy be a current controlled voltage source. where the magnitude is expressed as R times some reference current IX, where R has units of volts per amp. All right, so how are we all feeling to this point? Anybody have any questions about anything before we move along to our last two electrical quantities that I'd like to talk about for today?
All right, nobody's saying much of anything. Don't see anything in the chat. So what I would like to talk about next are the concepts of power and energy. So power is defined to be the rate of energy transfer in a system. Mathematically, power P is simply the product of current and voltage or we can call it the derivative of energy where power has units of watts and one watt is equal to one volt times one amp or one joule per second. Energy. is the total amount power absorbed or supplied by a circuit element. over a fixed duration of time. So energy is simply the integral of power from some point in time T1 to some later point in time. T2. So in this class, we are going to use what's called the passive sign convention. And this bit right here can get a little bit confusing. So I'm going to take my time and, and talk our way through it. So let's say that I have a generic circuit element let's call this element A and we observe a voltage drop VA across the terminals of element A, having the polarity that I've indicated. And we observe a current IA flowing into the positive polarity terminal and out of the negative polarity terminal. In this instance, we can say that element A absorbs a power P 
is equal to IA times BA. And we could say that element A supplies the power P is equal to negative IA times VA. So whenever we have current flowing into the positive polarity terminal, we consider the product of I and V to be the amount of power absorbed by the element. And the negative of the absorbed power is the supplied power. Now let's consider something very similar. We have a generic circuit element B over which we observe a voltage VB, positive polarity on top, negative polarity on bottom. And we have current IB that is flowing into the negative polarity terminal and out of the positive polarity terminal. In this case, element B is supplying P is equal to IB VB. And element B is absorbing P is equal to negative IB VB. So I am very regularly going to ask you to determine the amount of power or the amount of energy that is either supplied or absorbed by a particular circuit element. I'm going to start asking you that stuff. Um, literally in today's in-class assignment, actually in a little example problem that I want to work. And I'm actually going to continue asking you those types of questions all the way through your final. And uh, if you have any friends who have taken the class before, or you happen to be repeating the class, uh, you know that I am not in any way, shape, or form joking about this. There will be questions about supplying and absorbing power literally on the final as well as on the first test, as well as the second test, as well as practically every homework assignment, okay? So it is rather important that you are able to understand this concept of the passive sign convention um, pretty quickly. Um, you can fake your way through it to some extent by putting in an answer into your web work or whatever, and then it tells you you're wrong and you just change the sign and it tells you you're right um, for your homeworks, but you're not really gonna have that luxury for your exams because I am enough of a jerk to put both the positive answer and the negative answer as valid guesses on the exam to force you to actually learn how to do this, okay? So we are going to work our way through Uh, an example here. So let's say that we have following circuit. Here we have some element A. Here we have some element B. Here 
here we have some element C. Here we have some element D. Here we have some element E. Let's say that the voltage drop across element A is two volts with this polarity and the current flowing through element A is two amps with this polarity. Uh, let's say that the voltage drop across element B is eight volts having this polarity and the current flowing through element B is negative two amps having this particular direction. Let's say that the voltage drop over element C is 10 volts. The current flowing through element C is four amps. The voltage drop over element D is 10 volts with this polarity. The current flowing through element D is five amps for this direction. And let's say that the voltage drop over element E is negative 10 volts with this polarity. And the current flowing through element E is negative three amps with this direction. What I want us to determine is the power supplied by all five elements. And I would greatly appreciate some feedback from you guys while we work this problem. Yeah. So let's start with element A. What's the voltage drop across element A? <laughs> Two, volts. Two volts, absolutely correct. What's the current flowing through element A? Two amps. Two amps, right. Literally just reading it off, okay? Now, does the current flow into the positive polarity or into the negative polarity terminal? Negative. That's correct. The current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So since we are trying to find the power supplied, we can leave these quantities alone, okay? So the power supplied by element A is four watts. Now let's look at element B. What's the voltage drop across element B? Eight volts. Thank you, eight volts. And the current flowing through element B is negative two amps. Now, is that current flowing into the positive polarity terminal or into the negative polarity terminal of element B? Positive. Right. So since the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal, eight volts times negative two amps gives us the power absorbed by element B. Since we were asked to find the power supplied by element B, 
we have to multiply this product by a factor of negative one. And so that's gonna give us positive eight times positive two is 16 watts. So element B is supplying 16 watts of power. For element C, our voltage is 10 volts. Our current is four amps. Is the current flowing into the positive polarity terminal or into the negative polarity terminal? Positive. Into the positive, right. So 10 volts times four amps or 40 watts is our absorbed power. Since we want supplied, we need to include a minus sign. And so this is gonna look like negative 40 watts of power. For element D, we have a voltage of 10 volts, current of five amps. Is the current flowing into the positive polarity terminal or into the negative polarity terminal? Negative. Right. So that means that this guy is supplying 50 watts of power. And lastly, for element E, we have a voltage of negative 10 volts, a current of negative three amps. Is the current flowing into the positive polarity terminal or into the negative polarity terminal? Positive. Right. So since it's into the positive polarity terminal and we want supplied power, we need to introduce this negative sign here. And so this gives us negative 30 watts. Okay. I know that this seemed very trivial. And honestly, it was. Um, but I do not want to discourage anybody who struggles with, with this from asking questions, okay? Um, generally speaking, all you really need to do is look back at this simple reference, okay? Whenever the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal, the element is absorbing I times V and supplying negative I times V. Whenever the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal, the element is supplying I times V and absorbing negative I times V. It doesn't need to be any more difficult than that, but this concept can be confusing to people. So I'm very happy to answer questions about it and to continue answering questions about it as we play around with our signs when we're uh, applying our circuit analysis techniques in the future. Now, one last thing that I want to note here before I stop talking for the day is what's called Telogen's theorem. Telogen's theorem simply states that the sum of all of the absorbed power in a system must equal to sum of all of the supplied power in a system. Now, it's not directly stated here, but it is implied that we're talking about absorbed power and supplied power as positive quantities. So if we looked at this last 
example here, the amount of power supplied is the power supplied by element A, which is four watts, the amount of uh, power supplied by element B, which is 16 watts, and the amount of power supplied by element D, which was 50 watts. So if we added all these together, we would have a total supplied power of 70 watts. For our absorbed power, we're simply gonna add all of the negative quantities together, right? So element C is absorbing 40 watts, element E is absorbing 30 watts, and when we add these two together, we get 70 watts, okay? All intelligence theorem says the amount of power, uh, positive absorbed power has to equal the amount of positive supplied power in a system. All right, so the last thing that I want to do here is very, very quickly is to bring up the web work. If I can find my stylus and give you uh, a warning or two about a few problems as a, hopefully a little bit of help here. Um, all of your homework assignments have been assigned and they all close at midnight on August the 12th, which is the last day of the quarter. So if you've you can get ahead on videos. You can start working on later things. Uh, I just wanted to let you all know that. If you have not been assigned to the homework sets, please let me know as soon as you possibly can because I need to contact Dr. Dave Meng uh, effectively to get you added to the class probably. All right, so if we look at problem number one here. Um, we are given a mathematical description of a current waveform um, over a couple of intervals. And we were asked to evaluate this current at a particular time. So that seems fairly straightforward. It's just direct substitution. Then we're asked to find the total amount of charge that passed through the element in a particular interval. Um, we worked an example problem on something like that. So that's not particularly difficult. And then the average current is simply that total amount of charge from part C divided by the duration of the time interval. So that problem seems fairly straightforward. For problem number two, we are given a waveform for the power and we are asked to determine the total amount of energy that's supplied uh, during this interval. Um, since we have power and we want energy, or excuse me, energy, uh, we simply need to take the integral of this waveform, which is just the same as adding the area under the curve. One thing that I want to point out here is that the time is expressed in minutes, not seconds, so that you will need to do some sort of mathematical conversion uh, to get the units to work out correctly for your integration. Um, the average power is simply the answer from part A uh, divided by um, the duration of the waveform. And then the answer for part C, the average current, is simply the average power divided by the voltage that's provided in the problem state. So nothing particularly wild or crazy there. Um, for this problem right here, this is extraordinarily similar to what we just did um, on that last example problem that we worked. Uh, this problem is relating charge and current again. Um, we're given an expression for Q as a function of time, and then we're asked for the charge at a particular time, so we simply substitute in that value for T. Um, the maximum amount of charge in the interval, um, this wasn't discussed in this class because it was discussed in your calculus classes. Um, how do you find the maximum value of a function? Anybody?
All right, so to find the maximum value of a mathematical function, you take the derivative of the function and set uh, its variable, or, and set the function, excuse me, take the derivative of the function and then set the derivative equal to zero. And you would solve for the variable that causes that to happen, then plug that variable back in and you get the maximum value. Um, the rate that charge is being accumulated, that's just simply asking you for the current. So you would take the derivative of Q. Let's see, problem five here. This is one that trips up a lot of people um, and it's purely due to the wording here. So in my version of the problem, it asks which of the DC sources above are supplying power? What it should really state is which of the DC sources above are supplying positive power. Okay. So you'll evaluate this circuit much like we did the example problem. If the answer comes out to be positive, check that box. If the answer comes out to be negative, do not check the box. Some people have a very similar problem, except that it'll say something about absorbing power. It means positive absorbing power as well. And then for problem six here, again, just looking at the passive sign convention, um, but there is a dependent source that has been added into this circuit um, that you will need to pay a bit of attention to. Um, let's see here. All right, so those are your homework problems. Um, I've talked about any potential pitfalls that I've seen. A lot of these are very similar to what we've done here in this class. Now I'm gonna pull up your in-class assignment. So this is your first in-class assignment problem. Um, for this first problem, one potential thing that might come bite you in the butt here is that I give omega the angular frequency of our sinusoidal function in radians per second. And I would be willing to bet the overwhelming majority of you leave your calculators in degree mode as default. Um, the expectation here is that you would either multiply by a conversion factor of 180 degrees over pi to convert the angular frequency from radians to degrees, or just put your calculator in radians mode, and you should be able to just answer this one very straightforwardly. Uh, for problem number two, um, Nothing particularly wild or crazy here. Be playing around with exponential functions a little bit. And then for problem three, it's a more simplified version of effectively one of your homework problems. All right, so uh, I'm done talking for the day for this lecture. I'm going to mute myself and just leave my Zoom open. If anybody has any questions about any of the in-class assignment problems, should you choose to work on them now, which is kind of the point, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, if you want to let things marinate and then work on it later, and you run into a question, just shoot me an email or show up in my virtual office hours. All right, thank you guys for your time and uh, I'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Um, so the question was asked if we need to use engineering format uh, and the answer is absolutely not. 
um, for this, uh, the in-class assignments, whatever kind of scratchy, scribbly work you care to submit is absolutely fine by me. Don't spend a lot of time trying to make it look pretty. Um, it's uh, the in-class assignments are more for identifying kind of what you don't know um, than, than being any kind of formal assignment. So where are we turning this in at? Good question. So if you go to Moodle, and I don't know why it's telling me that I'm currently logged out. All right, let me move this chat window because it's confusing me. You go to our course page, and then we click on class meeting two with today's date. Um, you can't see the solutions guide yet because I have it closed for you all until after the assignment itself is due. Um, but below the PDF for the in-class assignment set of problems, there should be an online submission portal. Um, let me know if you see it on your screen. I do not see it on my screen. Would you mind sharing your screen? Let me see if I can set that up real quick. It's on my middle page under class meeting two. It has the in-class assignment. So our, let me ask a, a, a different question here real quick. Um, did you log into the V84 Moodle page or the 084 Moodle page? Oh, yep, that's exactly what I did. Okay, yeah, so I'm just gonna put everything on the V84 page because there was 30 students in that and uh, I think only six students in the 084 one. So it was just easier for me to do all of the administration on the V84. So I added all of you 084 students to this section as well, just, just to keep it to be less of a pain in the butt for me. So sorry about that confusion. Oh, good. Thank you very much. No problem. Anything else? All right. Well, like I said, I'll mute myself and I'll be on Zoom, uh, halfway paying attention for any questions in the chat or anything like that for the next half hour, if you happen to have any. Um, I do have a question. Sure. Do you mind going back to the notes where you did the absorb slash supply thing, like the little diagram before we did the problem? Not at all. I got this so messed up last time I took this class. So I just want to make sure. So the top one, you're saying it's absorbing if it leaves the positive. Okay, so I think I understand like, where you're getting confused here. So if I extended this connection, mm -hmm. The current hits this terminal, which is associated with the positive polarity first, mm -hmm. and it's leaving out the negative. So if it hits the positive polarity first, it's flowing into the positive polarity terminal. Mm -hmm. If it were to hit the positive polarity second, so like this guy right here, let's extend this, right? So we have our current IB going into the negative polarity terminal, flowing all the way through B and then exiting the positive polarity terminal. That's what we consider flowing into the negative. Okay. Okay, I got you. All right, so like just to beat this horse straight to death, 
okay? Bear, bear with me here. This current right here hits the negative sign first, so it's flowing <laughs> through the negative polarity terminal. This current right here hits the positive sign first, so it's flowing into the positive polarity terminal. Okay, yeah. I understood the drawing and what you were saying by N2, but then when I went back up, then I was like, wait, that looks like the opposite, but I, I, I get it now. Okay, good deal. Thank you. No problem.